sermon. The sermon is in your bulletin for today. For those online watching, I apologize. I did not have the opportunity to get to you one of the handouts online. It was um, my mistake. I just have been suffering a little bit this morning. I'm doing the best I can to be here today. And so some things didn't get done, but it's a very simple handout compared to the last few weeks. As you know, the last few weeks we've been doing uh, David and Saul and, and Solomon, and so they've been very complex lessons. Today is a very simple lesson, and it's a short lesson. It's one I think that you will be able to follow along quite easily, even if you do not have a handout. But I want to read to you from the Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter, because this is the lesson that I want you to hear for today. And our lesson begins with Jesus walking with his disciples, and he went from there, it says in the Gospel of Mark, the ninth chapter, he went from there and passed through the city of Galilee, or through the area of Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know of it. For he was teaching his disciples, and he said to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of human humans, and they will kill him. And in three days after being killed, he will rise again. But his disciples did not understand this and what Jesus was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when they went to the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about along the way? But they were silent, for they had been arguing with one another about who was to be the greatest amongst the disciples. And Jesus sat them down and called the twelve and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it in his arms and took it and said to them, Whoever wants to be, whoever welcomes one such as this child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me, uh, who, you, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me only, but the one who has sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're talking about you today. That's right, little one, Rose. So, of all things about little children. You know, and it does remind me as we begin our lesson for today, I actually have a, an acquaintance, a friend, who I was really embarrassed by. And I'm saying this to you because sometimes parents are, are a little concerned when their babies are acting up. I love it when Rose is, is squealing and, and, and happy and, and playing and even crying, and it's okay. But he did something that really upset me. Because, again, notice in the scripture, it talks about welcome, welcoming little children in my name. And I think we will be judged oftentimes by how we welcome those in the name of Christ. People who are less mature than us. I think people who are children, people who need our care. And sometimes we treat those people worse than we do the people who are like us. We like people like us, people in the same maturity level as us and so forth. But we treat some other people horribly. And it's sometimes reflected in how we treat children. And so this friend of mine, actually, when there was a baby who was crying in a service, a pastor, he actually stopped his sermon, and he, put the, he walked in the aisle, and he said, you should know better. He said, that baby should be silent, and you need to take that child out of here. And I'm reminding you, parents, when your babies are squirming around, take them out of the service for the comfort of everybody else. You know what I would say to you as parents? Keep your babies in the service. If they're squirming and squealing and, and fidgeting a little bit, I get it because, you know, I fidget too. I get bored with my sermons as well. So trust me, I understand. We love having the children here. We're so grateful that Rose is here today. And this is ultimately what the lesson is about. And I, I title our sermon today, for those who do not have the handouts online, The uh, Gospel According to Chip and Dale. Now, one of the things that I hope to have for you is a video and a clip of Chip and Dale. Now, mind you, not the Chip and Dales, but Chip and Dale. You get the difference? There is a big difference, let me tell you. The Chip and Dales would be a little not appropriate here for church and for kids. The chip, that's the, you know, guys, the strippers. I'm talking about Chip and Dale, the chipmunks. You remember them? And how Chip and Dale were at one time, you know, they, they would always try to outdo each other with their generosity. No, you first. No, you first. No, you first. If you can imagine that, that's what I'm talking about, the gospel according to Chip and Dale. It's always, no, you first. No, you first. It's always you first because that is the spirit and the attitude of what we Christians are supposed to have. It is that you first mentality that we as Christians are called to have according to Jesus. And the reason why this came up, and Jesus mentioned this, if you look at our gospel for today, is because the disciples were fighting about what? Who would be the boss? Who is going to be in charge? 
And so they were really, really arguing about this. And Jesus said, what were you guys talking about all the way? And they were kind of embarrassed by this because that's exactly what they're saying. Saul, or, uh, Peter was probably saying, well, how about me? And I'm sure somebody else was saying, well, how about me? John, maybe. Maybe some of these other guys. But Jesus sits the disciples down and he lets them know in no uncertain terms that Jesus says that God values the servant even more than the person who's the leader. And if you want to be a leader, you're going to do it by serving. So if all of us are trying to be Chip and Dale and trying to outdo each other in our service to God, who is in charge? It's God, right? That's the one Sunday school answer you can say and be right. It is God who is in charge of the Christian life. And if all of us have God in charge and all of us are trying to outdo each other in our service to each other, then we are living the Christian life the way God intends us to. And so we start in the Old Testament because this is a common theme that runs all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And if you have your handouts for today, uh, in fact, you know what? Um, can somebody grab me one of those? Thank you. So I want to show you guys online what this looks like. Here, here, here. Terry, is that a good, good location? Can they see the triangle there? Yeah. Am I up there far enough? Okay, right there. You see the triangle. Notice who is on top of the triangle. It's God. And down below at the bottom of the triangle on the horizontal line is you and me. This is exactly, thank you, Corey. I'm probably going to grab that again in just a moment. That is exactly the way the relationships are set out in the book of Genesis when God creates humanity. God is the boss. God is at the top of the triangle. We're in the bottom, you and me, and we are in equal relationship with each other. We are in equal relationship with God. Now, when I say equal relationship with God, that doesn't mean that we are equal to God. But understand what I mean by this. I am in the same type of relationship with God that you are in. And so oftentimes, we act as though some of us have a better, holier relationship with God than others. Um, a lot of churches, they preach this and teach this. It seems like one person seems to be holier. And I, I tell you, when I came to this congregation, I was set right with this very quickly. Because you see, I've got my master's degree, so I have my master's divinity, and I'm ordained as a clergy person, and isn't that grand? And I come into a church where the average education level is an eighth grade education level, and these people humbled me like you wouldn't believe. Because I found especially one fellow by the name of John Pertilla, a couple of you remember John. John was one of the most godly people I've ever met and ever been privileged to know. He had an eighth grade education. That was it. And so if we're depending on the education or seminary education somehow makes me higher than or holier than somebody, I certainly was put in my place very quickly with John because he was one of the most godly men I've ever met. And so, you know, in some churches, they put their pastor on a pedestal. I don't think pastors deserve to be put on a pedestal. We're no better than anybody else. You can have an eighth grade education and have an intimate relationship with God that is powerful, if not more so, than any pastor or clergy person. And so I encourage you to, with these words, I don't have a better relationship with God than any of you do. You and me, again, are equal in our relationship with God. And the other thing the book of Genesis tells you, this is just kind of free. It doesn't necessarily directly relate to the lesson today. But males and females are in equal relationship with God according to the book of Genesis. We just noticed this online. We do a lot of looking at some of the online things. Our friend Jen, who very well may be watching today, online, just posted something the other day about how one of her friends posted an opinion about women just need to be obedient to their husbands, and they have to be subservient to their man. And she said, that didn't set well with Jen. If you know Jen, that doesn't set well. She's a very strong, tough woman. That doesn't set well with my wife, because my wife is a very strong, powerful woman as well, as I know most of you women here are today. See, God has created us to be equal partners. This idea that men are a boss and men are in charge is a result of a three-letter word called what? S ends with an N, and there's an I in there somehow. What's that word? Sin. 
Male and female are in equal relationship before God. You are in equal relationship with God as I am. My position as a pastor, because I'm ordained, because I have a degree, isn't any more significant than anybody with an eighth grade education. We are all equal before God's eyes. So this thing called sin, what is sin? Sin is the desire to replace God with ourselves. So Corey, I'm going to steal your hand out again. I want to show this and you're going to have to help me out here, Terry. I'm going to look at this line right here where my finger is and tell me, can they see it online right now? Over a little bit, down a little bit, up a little bit, right there. So you see that line and notice who has replaced God. I have replaced God. There's an arrow pointing down and underneath of that is everybody else. Notice that God isn't even on this second illustration. Because I have taken the place of God. I've ousted God. That's what sin is. It's putting me first at everybody else's expense. That's what sin is. So we create a vertical relationship between you and me. And this never works. You want to know why? Because it creates nothing but heartache, pain, and destruction whenever we try to impose our own will upon everybody else. Look at what we've done to the planet, how we've destroyed it, because we haven't cared for the thing that God has given us care for. Why have we destroyed it? Because we put ourselves and our own wants and desires first. Carissa, that gets her excited because she's really big on that. And, and I, I'm in 100% agreement with that. Why do we harm relationships? Why do relationships fall apart? Because we in our relationships put ourselves first at your expense. If married couples could get this idea that the most important person in their life is a person sitting across from them when they get married, and they realize that their primary job is to please and care for that person to whom they're getting married, then we will understand the will of God. Now, it's not just marriage. Corey's my partner, and Terry's my partner. All of you sitting here are my partners in Christ. I am not preeminent over you. I have got to be on an equal relationship with you. I must submit to you out of reverence for Christ because sin is a result of me or you putting yourself ahead of me or me putting myself ahead of you at your expense. So this is the way of God. The way of God is simply this. The way of God requires trust. Trust that God will have our best interests at heart and trust that our brothers and sisters in Christ will have our best interests at heart as well and that we are here to outdo each other with generosity and our willingness to serve each other. So what about my needs in this picture? So if I'm not worried about my needs, who's taking care of my needs? You are, right? I'm supposed to take care of your needs. You're supposed to care for my needs. And especially in a marriage relationship, that's what we're supposed to do for each other. Sick as a dog yesterday, my wife was feeling tired, but she was still taking care of me because she's a godly person. And she loves me. I, I know that. She shows me all the time. She's awesome. What's that? That was going to be an I think. I think. No, it wasn't. I heard you start to make a G sound. I think. <laughs> she does it out of holy out. No, I think, I think she does love me. Otherwise, she wouldn't put up with me. So said I think, yeah. I think. <laughs> you know, there's only a little bit I really know in life. And I think one of the things I know is God loves me, and I also think my wife loves me. And outside of that, I think Carissa loves me. Do you love me too? Yes. Okay, that's good. So... So what about my needs? My, our needs are always taken care of by other people. When we seek first the kingdom of God, what does the Bible say? All these things will be yours as well. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be yours as well. One of the things that amazes me about our example today in Jesus and the lesson he was teaching his disciples, Jesus came to earth is God amongst us and didn't come to demand that we be subservient to him, but he came to be a servant. He didn't come to lord it over top of us, but he came to give himself and pour himself out for us. And so he was being an illustration, a living illustration, a walking parable for his disciples about how we are supposed to live our life and pour ourselves out for other people. 
of all people, Jesus has the right to demand that we be of service to him. But Jesus comes and pours himself out for our sake. Jesus leads by example of service. And here's the amazing thing. That has got to teach you how much the Father must love you. That he was willing to pour his life out for you rather than come down and demand that you be subservient to him. That's how much God loves you. That God himself came to be your servant, not to be served by you. So we go back to this triangle again. I'm going to grab it one more time and just remind you online. You can look at it for those of you who have it. So Terry, tell me when it's in focus again. Right there. Right there, you see that triangle? This is the will of God. To restore this relationship that God is at the top of our pyramid and that we are in relationship, you and me with each other, that horizontal line, we are equal to each other, we are called to be subservient to each other, and when we serve each other, thank you, when we serve each other, we take care of each other's needs. When you t I take care of your needs, you take care of my needs, all of our needs will be met because we are subservient to one another for the sake of Jesus Christ. Now, I hope to show another video. Uh, Terry has put a link. What do you call that, Terry? A bitly. A bit? Lee. Lee. A bitly. That is the first time I recall hearing that word. I know very little about this technology stuff. For those of you who know what a bitly is, it's, there's, uh, there's, it's online at our, our page where we're streaming services. Terry put it out there. It's a link to the video that we were supposed to watch. We may watch that as a group here once we're done with our service today, but I encourage you to watch it and end your service with that. It's really an illustration of what was uh, what's called the, the parable or the allegory of the long spoons. Maybe you've heard this. Now, I'm going to impress you because this was written by a guy by the name of Rabbi Haim of Ronschenschach. Does anybody know who this guy is? I don't know either. And you know what? I'm convinced nobody does either. I, I actually looked this guy up. You cannot find anything online anywhere about this guy. The only thing you do is if you search him, Terry's probably going to go and do this right now. You search this guy's name, Rabbi Haim of Rosh Hashach, you will keep looking and looking. You'll go down a rabbit hole from one pastor after another, after another, after another, from one decade to the next, after the next, saying, this allegory of the long spoons was told by this traveling rabbi Hain, but nobody knows who the heck the guy is. So I'm convinced it's kind of like an online uh, fable or something that goes round and round. Nobody knows who actually started the thing, but it just keeps going round and round. Honestly, I'm convinced that the person who started this, this parable or allegory of the long spoons was probably a 10-year-old girl, girl who wrote a story back in 1930 for a writing contest. And now all of a sudden, just to give it some credibility, we say, oh, it's, it's Rabbi Haim. Nobody knows who Rabbi Haim is. Nobody can figure out even what century he lived in. It's just something that's been passed around from century after century after century. So who are decade after decade. So anyway, so whether there really was a Rabbi Haim or whether it's a 10-year-old girl, nevertheless, the parable of long spoons is a very powerful illustration of how we Christians are to live our lives. And it goes something like this. You see, the difference between heaven and hell is not the table which we feast at. In heaven and hell, there is this huge long table in which there's ample food for everybody to eat. And the difference is, and, and we all have connected to our arms these spoons and forks that are so big that we cannot feed ourselves. So in hell, they've got ample food, but they're sitting there trying to feed themselves, and they can't do it. But in heaven, the difference is they've got the same big table with ample food, the same forks and spoons connected to their arms. They can't feed themselves, so guess what they decide to do? They feed each other. And that is the parable, the allegory, I should say, of the long spoons. We are called by God to feed and care for each other. If you care for the person beside you, and they care for you, our needs will be met. And we do it today out of reverence for Christ. So we're going to bow our heads today. We're going to kind of revamp and redo that song that we just sang as a part of communion. 
And I'm going to send you forth in peace. For those who are here in our service today, physically, we will show you that parable. It's a one-minute parable. If you have the opportunity online, I encourage you to click that link. You're welcome to do so as soon as we're done with our prayer today. So let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for, um, for creating us to be in relationship with each other. And this is a very difficult thing because we don't always trust each other. And you know, sometimes that lack of trust has is, is been earned. Sometimes we've hurt each other, and sometimes we haven't cared for those around us. Sometimes people around us haven't cared for us. But God, for those who are rooted in Christ, who understand the great depth of love that God has for us, that Jesus Christ came to be a servant, not to be served by us. We too are inspired by this example and pray that you would use us to be servants of one another so that all of our needs in this world might be met. We just dedicate ourselves to you, to your service and the service of each other. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're again just going to sing two verses of this.